All right, are you ready to start? Say yes. 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 My name is Majid Like Magic. And I always say it just like that. I say Majid Like Magic. Because when you say it with a beat, it makes it easy to repeat. And I believe as a speaker, we're here not just to be easily remembered, but to be impossible to forget. Be unforgettable. So it's Majid Like, you say it. Everybody, please stand up. Everybody follow me. Form a single file line right behind me. Nice and tight, nice and tight. Got a single file line, say yes. Yes. And the back is looking sloppy. Tighten it up. All right, hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you. And massage. Make some noise. And now chop, 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 chop. Oh, say, ah. Hands straight up. Turn the other way. Hands on the shoulders of the person in front of you. And massage. And chop, 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 chop. And say, ah. All right, give your partner a little hug. All right, now everybody down here on the edge of the stairs, please. Everybody down here on the edge of the stairs. Right there is good. All right, welcome to the art of confident communication. We're gonna go on a little journey. We're gonna go on a journey from zero to 10 out of 10 in confidence on communication. So imagine there's a spectrum where here is zero on confidence of communication, and when we get to the pillows area, it's a 10. Now I want you to show me the posture of a zero out of 10 communicator. Now look around you, how everybody, even though you were born in different places, speaking different words, you did the same posture, okay? Now I want you to introduce yourself, say hello my name is and say your name, but do it at a zero out of 10. Okay. Now I want you to slowly walk over until we're over there and as you're going from zero to 10, I want you to notice how your posture changes. You're becoming a two, you're becoming a four, you're becoming a six, and I want you to notice what, what comes into your mind as how you see yourself becoming a more confident communicator, and let's all slowly meet over there. We're still gonna be standing and we're still gonna be outside of the pillow area, but then I'm gonna introduce you to your 10 out of 10 communicator self. So come on the journey with me. Notice how your posture changes. Notice how the way you speak changes. Notice how your inner dialogue changes. Notice how people see you differently. You're now at the two out of 10. You're now at the four out of 10. And notice how you know what a four out of 10 is and a six out of 10 is. You already know. I'm seeing some eights up here looking good. Notice how your inner dialogue changes. Okay, amazing. Now, Imagine you're all at 10 out of 10. Show me the posture of a 10 out of 10 communicator. Can you breathe better? Say yes. 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 Can you circulate better? Say yes. yes. Are you leading with your heart? Say yes. yes. Okay, now introduce yourself nice and loud as a 10 out of 10 communicator. All right, please come take a seat. I introduced myself as you as a 10. Ah, Majid. Good. 
Like magic. Good. Check. <clears throat> All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Introduce myself again. I'm Majid Like Magic. My kids call me Daddy. You can call me either one. Magic Daddy. <laughs> if you had a nickname for the most confident version of yourself, what would it be? Bird. Domo. Bird. Domo. Domo. Majid. What is it? Snaxel. Snaxel. <laughs> Do you believe you can change characters? Yeah. Yes. All right. So pick your character. Choose your character. All right. We made a lot of promises. We made a pretty, pretty <laughs> big awesome. list of exciting things to cover today. But why are you here? Take a moment. Check in. Why are you here? Turn to your neighbor and tell them. Why are you here? Thirty seconds left. <laughs> All right, now turn to your labor, na turn to your neighbor, look him in the eye, give him a high five, and say you're awesome. All right, I'd like to start with a story, and this is the story of what is the professional speaker's most important job. I promised those of you who are on time, I would tell you the secret. A professional speaker's most important job is, who knows? To speak. To speak is good, but more importantly? Tell a story. Tell a story, what else? Listen. Listen. Communicate. Communicate. Pause. 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 Keep attention. Keep attention. Mind. You're all wrong. Get it's be there on time. Yeah. It's be there on time. Because if you're not there, none of that stuff happens because you're not there. I learned this one the hard way. There I was in Ottawa, Canada, where I live. And I had a paid speaking engagement in a town called Kingston. It's King's Town, Kingston, former capital of Canada, fun fact. Two hours away driving. So I like to get there an hour early because I'm a professional. So I left three hours before my stage time. I'm driving along, I'm visualizing myself speaking on stage, I'm going through the slides in my head, and then I hit a thing I forgot about. Traffic. Highway traffic. Cars slowed down and then they stopped. The kind of stopping on the, on the highway that you can get out of the car and go, whoo, that's a long line of cars. I got back in my car and I started sweating. I started sweating like a whore in church. <laughs> <laughs> Those cars weren't moving at all. So I texted my guy, my guy, my contact. He's got 800 high school students running around the campus of Queens University. I'm texting him, I'm in traffic. He's like, so what? Get here. Because your most important job is to get there on time. Well, eventually traffic starts moving, and I look at Google Maps, says you're going to arrive right at the time I'm supposed to be on stage, but I'm still an hour away. So now my body is pumping with adrenaline. I finally get to the address on time, but when you get to a university address, it's like, congratulations, you're in the area. <laughs> Good luck. So I'm trying to find parking. I'm trying to read, do I need a purple label or a red label, and do I pay this machine? I get there, and I'm like, where's Johnson Hall? And I'm running, and I'm sweating, and there's 800 hungry high school students, and I'm late. And I proceed to give the least professional, the least fabulous, presentation of my career. So we've now implemented new policies. If it's out of town, go the night before. Splurge for the hotel. 
if it's a conference at a hotel, stay at the hotel. You can get in a taxi and the car can break down between there and there. Get there on time, most important thing for a professional speaker. But how does this apply to you now? Well, we're living together, and my question is, can I trust you? We're living together, and my question is, can I trust you? Now you might think, of course you could trust me, I'm a good person. But how can I trust you when you can't get your body to a place that you said you would on time? How can I trust you if you can't keep your word, you said you were gonna be there? How can I trust you when you don't speak with integrity and precision? Raise your hand if I asked you if you were coming here, keep it up. Okay, keep your hand up if I had to ask you a clarifying question. Okay, thank you. So if I asked you, are you coming here? A lot of people said, I think so, maybe. We'll see if it's in flow and alignment. Have you heard that one? Okay. We get it, you're the main character. We've seen your cool hat. We've seen your cool scarf. And when you walk in all flowy and late, like we can start now. We get it, it's cool, but what if you were early? What if you had so much impeccability in your language that I could trust every single word you said? What if you never said maybe? So I'm gonna give you some language shifts that will make you a higher integrity person, not only to other people, but to yourself. Instead of saying I have to, say I, sh I choose to or I get to. I don't have to give this presentation. I choose to give this presentation. I get to pre give this presentation. If you want to take notes, that's a writer downer. You can write down have to with an arrow to choose to with an arrow to get to. When you go from have to to choose to, you go from victim to creator. When you go from choose to to get to, you go from creator to grateful. You don't have to anything. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. While we're at it, don't say but, say and. Replace every but with and. I really like you, Fish, but what just happened? Whatever's coming next, cancel the first part. Right? I like you and. How do we talk about time? You ever, you ever hear you say to yourself, oh, I really want to, but, oh, I can't. Ugh. Because I don't have time. How about you're choosing not to because it's not important? That's okay. You're choosing not to because it's not a priority. That's okay. Don't say I wish I could, but I can't because I don't have time. I make time for what's important, and so do you. I wish I could work out more, but it's hard. I'm choosing to get better at exercise because I love my body. I was really proud of myself the other day. Someone asked me, why don't you drink? I rarely get this question anymore, but I haven't drinking for a long time. And I used to have a story. Well, the thing is, I become kind of an asshole when I drink, and then I have these hangovers, and I used to tell the story. And immediately, without thinking, I just said, because I love my body. Duh. Oh, oh yeah. I've programmed that into myself. Notice how you speak. This is the art of confident communication. Now, it's not just you being confident, but it's also giving other people confidence. Can other people trust you? Are you precise with your language? I know you want to keep your options open. I might go to the party. We'll see how I feel. Let's go a little bit more certain. I'm planning to go to the party. Okay, so that's like a certain intention, but I'm still not sure you're going to be there. So if, if you were in one of my clarifying conversations about are you attending, and you said, I want to, I want to go, I might have just said, you want to? Or if you said, I'll be there, I might have said, can I count on you? So what if you were so precise with your language that I can count on you in the line of battle? Can I count on you to go to battle with me? Yes. We're doing war metaphors. <laughs> All right. So uh, we'll tell you my story. I have been a professional speaker since 2006, and a professional speaker is someone who travels and speaks and gets paid to speak. So I've been paid over 427 times, I have a spreadsheet, not over 427 times, precisely 427 times. And my desire to become a paid speaker came from the question, how can I get paid to travel? 
I heard about these professional speakers on these speaking circuits and they get paid to go to conferences and the conference pays for the flight and the hotel and writes you a big check. And I had this vision and I'll give it to you because it's really fun. Imagine, there you are, backstage at the big conference. You're peeking behind the thick curtains and you see the house is full. That means every seat has someone excited to see you speak. And then the announcer speaks your precisely written hilarious introduction. They talk about your accolades and your history and then you hear your name and they say, ladies and gentlemen, bring to the stage. And then they say your name and they clap and you come out on stage and you plant your feet like an oak tree in the middle of the stage. You deliver your opening line and you got them. They're in the palm of your hand. They're paying attention. They're hanging on every word. You do your metaphors and you tell your stories and you make your points and you got your PowerPoints and the clickers working and then you come back to the center stage and you give your closing line, thank you. And then the crowd goes wild, go ahead. And you come off stage and cameras are snapping and people are asking for your autograph and finally the auditorium clears out and there's one person left in the room. It's the event planner who has written you a nice check. She reaches into her jacket pocket. She pulls out an envelope with your name on it. You open it up just to make sure the spelling on your name is correct and you see a lot of zeros. You put it away, tucked nicely, and you ask her one question. The same question you always ask your event planner at the end of a presentation. You say, did I exceed your expectations? She says, of course you did. We want you back next year. You give a little hug. You leave. There's your limo driver waiting for you, opening the door. You get into your limo. You drive to the airport. You check your messages, and your assistant has messaged you and says, multiple people have requested a paid keynote from you. You must have really crushed it on stage. And you go, I did. Put your phone away. And you get home to your beautiful life. And there you are, the traveling professional speaker. That's the image that I had in my mind at the beginning of the professional speaking career that I started about 15 years ago. Now I have a new image, it goes like this. Hey guys, it's Majid, what's up? Walking around, making videos. And I had this moment that I was so proud of. I had my two kids, Ruby and Charlie and they're downstairs playing, and I'm in a tank top, and I got a chair like this sitting on a desk with my laptop open, and I'm giving a presentation to doctors in Toronto, Canada, and it's February, and you don't want to be in Toronto, Canada in February, that's why I was in Costa Rica with my tank top. And I gave my presentation, and after the presentation, doctors came up to the laptop in Toronto and asked me questions, and I'm standing at my laptop in Costa Rica answering questions, and I get off the call, and right before I close the laptop, I say, guys, I got to go take my kids to the cloud forest in Costa Rica. Enjoy Canada in February. Have a nice day. And that is a speaking engagement. And now we have an opportunity that even while I'm here fully present in this moment with you, I'm also on a speaking tour on thousands of people's screens around the world. We have an opportunity. Here's tip number one. You know how the top of your phone has a, a little camera and you can see a little rainbow shiny thing, like a little shimmer of rainbow in, in the lens? Look at that like it's the shimmer of an eye of your ideal client. When you look at your phone, and by the way, this is your selfie stick, 15 degrees up. Takes off 10 pounds, you're welcome. All right. And you look into the eye of your ideal client and you speak to her as though you're having a conversation. And then all the thousands of people who hear your voice through their camera will feel like he was talking to me. So what's a speaking engagement now? It's a live stream. It's a podcast. It's a webinar. It's a keynote. It's a workshop. And we're also going to talk about confident communication in the form of conversation. Speaking in a way that you feel heard. Speaking in a way that you are understood. So one of the ways you do that is don't speak when other people are talking. How do you get people to stop talking? Part of it's your posture. Part of it's your presence. People know you're about to speak when you breathe in. And you might want to say, listen, listen, listen. Or look, 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 look. Look, listen. These are commands to the brain. 
So speak when people are listening. Speak as though people want to hear your message. Speak to be understood. How do you speak to be understood? You speak in the language that they speak. Okay, speak, speak with monk-like precision. Speak as though every word you say is manifesting. How are words made? They are spelled. Words are spelled. They're little spells, aren't they? If I say, how are you doing today? You say, great. I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. But if you are going to say fine, please say it like this. I'm doing fine. Because what you say to yourself is very important. Very powerful words, I am. Quite an incantation, I am. How are you, I am. You know who's always listening? You, yourselves. Sometimes we crave connection and we want to tell the story of the past where we were the victim because life was happening to me. And we get that connection because you tell that story. And even though the past doesn't exist, less the story you're speaking right now, you're telling that story so that you can get that familiar feeling of, oh, poor you. That's what we tell stories when life is happening to me. It's the lowest level of consciousness. It's a victim level of consciousness. What if life was happening for you? And we start to feel the gifts. By the way, those of you who've had traumatic experiences, all of you, and you learned from it, and you can tell the story as someone who has triumphed over the great challenge, the insurmountable task, people see you and they say, I want to be able to talk about my troubles like that one day. Because you've gotten to the level of consciousness that says life happens for me. Not to me, for me. So we speak and we create. When God made the whole thing, he put out what? The word. Word, you heard about that one? We speak with monk-like precision. So you ever been to a meditation class where they do walking meditation and they're like, left foot, right foot, and they're like, feel how your foot rolls on the floor. And then they take you and they let you eat and they're like, chew every little bite. You're like, I've never eaten like this. I'm feeling all of the texture of every bite. That's how they eat those monks. What if we did that with speaking? What if every word that flowed through you was as tasty as a monk eating his salad? In fact, when we start a sentence, do we even know where it's going? We're kind of like channeling those words from somewhere. Where are they coming from? We're just present at the moment as the words are coming to the voice. And where's the sentence going? I don't know. We're just channeling the sentence. But if you're so present, not because you're in the future with your anxiety and fears, not because you're in the past with your depressions and stories, but because you're so blissfully present, because you're channeling the words and you're choosing each word like a monk chews each bite. What if speaking was your new mindfulness practice? Pay attention to other people's words and when you hear words that you feel like you can improve, just say it back to them. You have to go to the market at three o'clock? Have to? You don't have enough time? Really? Who knows about manifesting with words? How does it work? You say what it is you want. Yeah. And the vibration frequency of those words yeah. match the experience. And you call it in the end. Okay, what's a better word than wanting? Desire. What's better than that? Deserve. Embody. Need. Embody need, deserve, create. What else, Travis? Tyler. Tyler uh, sorry, Tyler. Totally Excuse me. Um, know each other. Uh, what came to mind is embodying the experience as if it's already happened and 
being in that energy and by doing so, drawing that experience into those desires for you and not being in any type of separation or lack. Beautiful. Let's practice that right now. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Imagine your dream. Imagine your dream has come true. Now with your eyes closed, silently say it to yourself, what it is that has come true. Say the words to yourself. It is true now. Not I want it, not I wish it will happen. It is true now. See it. Feel it. Now let the feeling of the wish fulfilled fill you up. And notice the smile that's come across your face. Mmm, feels good. That's the feeling. That's it. And you're feeling it right now. Okay, when you're ready, open your eyes and come back. We do the things, we buy the things, we go to the places because we think it's going to make us feel the thing, and then we remember we can feel the thing now. Now, do you notice how when you infuse the words with the feelings, it feels different? So you want to speak with confidence? Infuse the words with the feelings. Now, because words are so powerful, we can take people on a total roller coaster. We can bring, bring people into the depths of pain and sorrow with story. We can bring people into the heights of hope and joy with story. As the facilitator, facil, facil from the Latin means easy, and facilitating is to make easy. We make the journey easy to facilitate. We want to take them on an emotional roller coaster, but I personally want to leave them on a note of hope and joy. Have you ever been to a talk where they're really good at making you cry and then you feel like you need to kind of take a shower afterwards because it's like, ugh, gosh. We can go there, but let's end here. Now we have webinars, we have summits, we have podcasts, we have keynotes. So my company is called Expert Speaker and I'll give you a copy of my best-selling book. It's been called Hotter Than Fifty Shades of Grey, mostly by me because I love that joke. Um, what I do is I help people who have businesses give talks that get clients. And there's a formula for that. And clients are people that have a problem. And talks that get clients are talks that show people how to solve that problem. And an ideal client listening to your talk will come to the conclusion in the middle of your speech, I'm going to hire that speaker. So there's, there's a way to get there consistently and predictably mathematically to the point where you can say, I got 100 people in my audience, I know I'm gonna get 20 clients, I know how much money that is, therefore I can spend X dollars to go there. <laughs> so a webinar, by definition, is a speech online that people register to attend. It can be pre-recorded, it can be live. Uh, you may see me deliver one by the pool. Uh, in fact, so I was in Experience House um, in October in Guatemala and I delivered several webinars that uh, were very profitable and taught people how I do that. How do you get people to, to attend your webinar? You give words on a screen that's a title and a description and you advertise it through video or posts that people are saying, that's gonna be the most important thing on that day at that time, more important than all the other things I have to do. Right now, usually people register and they're like, I'm definitely gonna be there unless anything else happens at that same time and then I'm just gonna watch the recording. Uh, maybe I'm gonna get the recording, maybe I won't watch the recording. It's usually how people go. So how do you get people to actually register, to actually show up, to actually watch, to actually stay until the end, and then actually do the next step in your process, which for most of my clients is to schedule a call. So give a talk that gets your ideal client to schedule a call. Podcasts. Podcasts are conversations usually with an expert that are gonna be recorded and distributed to the people of the future. And the intention is that your ideal client is gonna to listen to your podcast and go, man, I really dig your vibe. I wanna become your client. So I'm happy to support any of you while you're here in furthering your personal goals for distributing your message, particularly in a way that gets people to take action, like paying you money. When people pay you money, it's transformational for them. If you're in the healing arts, you have seen the magic of when someone pays you, they start healing. Why is that? It's a commitment. And the cells hear the commitment. They go, oh shit, we're doing this? Okay, fine, we'll start healing. Immediately. Yeah. All right, I'm going to give you my number one tip, 
tip for TikTok. So I started TikTok about six months ago, and a couple things went viral. One of them was a talk that I gave in Guatemala. By the way, I highly recommend you give a talk because this guy's the best videographer. And there was one 30-second clip that got 10 million views and 4,000 very angry comments. <laughs> Turns out angry people like, make the algorithm go crazy, right? So it was taken out of context, but I'm going to tell you what it was. Uh, so I was giving a talk on how to land speaking engagements, get clients, and one of the tips I give is how to answer the question, what do you charge? So the TikTok clip goes like this. It says, when they ask, what do you charge, never ever say a number. And this is where people got mad. So that you got to get them mad within like one second because then they're like, Ugh. so this is, what, this is what I recommend. When you, when you want to speak at a conference, uh, I'll, I'll tell you how to get a speaking engagement at a conference, but when they call you, and they say, what do you charge? This is your moment. Don't fuck it up. The way you fuck it up is you give a price because your price is probably too low or too high. So you say this, I'm happy to work within your budget. Why don't we make sure that I'm the right fit speaker first? And if we both agree that I'm the right fit, then I'll work within your budget. Fair enough. And they're like, oh, okay. And now you're running the conversation. You say, you give this question. This is a long question. I'm going to say it twice. It goes like this. Let's say you have me as your speaker and I take the stage and deliver a killer talk and everyone comes up to you afterwards and is like, that was a great talk. And you're thinking to yourself, bringing that speaker was a pretty good idea. And then we like become best friends and we do cool stuff together. And a year later, we're celebrating our one year anniversary of being buddies because you invited me to speak a year ago. And you call me a year later and you say, man, bringing you in as the speaker was the best decision I ever made. What would have to happen between now and a year from now for you to feel like bringing me as the speaker was the best decision you ever made? It's a long question, but it's guiding them through your future relationship. They bring you in, you crush it, cool stuff happens, you're still friends in a year. That question. So I'll say it one more time. Let's say you bring me in as your speaker, and I take the stage, and I do a great job giving the talk, and everyone comes up to you afterwards and say, that speaker was really great. And then we do a bunch of cool stuff after that, and then a year later, we're celebrating our friendship, and you call me up and you say, bringing you in as our speaker was the best decision I ever made. What would have to happen between now and a year from now for you to feel, and I use the word feel, like bringing me in was the best decision you ever made? That's how you get them to tell you that you're the right fit speaker, and you say it back to them. You say, okay, so you want me to talk about this? You want me to do that? And that will make you feel like it was the best decision you ever made? Okay, have I heard you correctly? I've understood you? Great. Now let's talk about the money. What financial parameters would you like us to work within? What financial parameters would you like us to work within? They gave you some range, they gave you some number, and you say the words, I can work with that. You wanna pay by credit card? Or if their number's low, you say, well, normally my fee is $10,000, and you're telling me your budget's $2,500. It would be out of integrity for me to, to, to deliver my $10,000 talk for $2,500. And, not but, and I would still love to work with you. So I would like to propose a $7,500 investment in our relationship. Here's what I think we could do. You've got a $2,500 budget. I've got a $10,000 fee. We want to work together. Here's what we can do. If the speech is going to be videoed, could you get me a copy of the video? They say yes. If there's going to be a photographer, could you get me cop copies of the photo? They say yes. If I do a great job, would you make three specific phone calls to three different people that you think might like having me as a speaker and giving me like a rave review for those three people? They say yes. Okay, those three things, the photos, the videos, and the three phone calls are worth $7,500 to me. I'll write that up in the proposal. $2,500 cash, $7,500 in favors, video, photos, and recommendations. We got ourselves a deal. You got yourself a $10,000 speaker for $2,500. How's that feel? They Woo! say, I love That's it. Amazing. I love it. Okay. That didn't all go in the TikTok clip, all right? It was just like the beginning part. So here's my tip on how to go viral on TikTok. Just start. Just do, a, just do a video. If you haven't done one, just do one. If you don't know about TikTok, it's a scrolly thing that eats your soul and just makes you watch it forever. Um, but it's the one platform that uh, you can get a big following very quickly, I think, right now. If you want to know all the social media strategies, talk to Harrison. He's uh, really, really, really smart with the social medias. So TikTok, um, what I do is I have a video crew come into my house and they set up lights and cameras and I sit down on a chair and I say smart stuff for like three hours. Then they leave my house 
and then videos just start getting posted up everywhere, like 50 of them. And by everywhere, I mean like LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, because I don't like to upload because I get nervous and I'm like, am I ugly in this video? I don't know. How do I caption it? I don't know. So I've taken that part out of the process and I've just done three hours in the seat once a month and then I get lots of videos on the internet. Okay, there's a saying in show business that if you want the money, you better be funny. Uh, humor is not an option. Humor is not an option. You better be funny. You have to be more engaging and more entertaining than other people's distractions. Assume your audience is probably hungover or on drugs. Am I right or am I right? No? Yeah? No? Okay. Um, when you tell a joke and it bombs, go like this. Hey, didn't I tell you I'm a part-time comedian? My jokes are only funny part of the time. See what I did? Okay. So you got to be having fun for them to be having fun. Now, humor is an evolved thing of our species where I say something witty and you laugh. And this is like most things for evolution. It's uh, evolved for survival and mating. And the laughter and the jokes are communications between the two for intelligence. So you're laughing because you're telling me that you're intelligent. This is for mating purposes. And I'm making jokes to tell you that I'm intelligent. You're laughing at my jokes. I'm making jokes. We're probably mating later. That's the idea. <laughs> so in conversation, humor is about timing. It's about response. But when you're on stage with a microphone and you don't have that response, you have to set up your own jokes. So when you watch uh, stand-up comedians, they do a setup and then a punchline a setup, and then a punchline. And then with the punchline, they'll joke again and joke again and joke again. It'll, you'll kind of feel like a rolling of laughter. So you got to really kind of feel that laughter and keep it up and keep it up and then call back to it later. So I might like make a we're mating later joke to refer back to what we just did there. Okay. When you call back to it later, they're like, oh yeah, we were laughing earlier. So it kind of brings the whole experience together. What's the most insightful thing you've learned so far? Three hours in the seat. No? Three hours what? In the seat. That's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And when I have three hours in the seat, I have a list like I'm going through now, and I just say things. And I imagine the camera lens is the eye of my ideal client, and I look right in the lens. And you know when someone asks you a question, you just answer it in conversation? Like when someone asks you a question in conversation, you're like, Hang on. You're not like, hang on, let me go practice something. Right. You just answer, right? So that's why you can just flow in front of a camera. You don't need to practice because you just imagine it's a person asking you a question. Mm -hmm. If you want to come up with 40 content ideas, come up with 40 questions. And if you want to come up with 40 questions in three seconds, go to ChatGPT. <laughs> right? What was the most important thing, uh, most insightful thing you've learned so far? Part time comedians are only funny. Part, Part of, the of the time. You got it. Okay, now, it's not what we know, but it's what we do with what we know that brings value to the world. So what will you do with that insight? I'm going to try it. Yeah, it's something very valuable for me. I'm going to do it. Okay, listen carefully. You're going to try it? I'm going to do it. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. What are you doing with that insight? With the part-time comedy? Yeah. Uh, embracing that it's okay to be funny only part of the time. Okay, good. Yes. It's definitely only funny, like, part of the time. <laughs> I'm so happy. Yes, <laughs> yes. Part of Yes. <laughs> All right. I also really like the, um, the run through of the negotiation, understanding yeah. how you can just leave without. Yeah. That was that, very beautiful. Cool. I like that you put it in the contract too. Who should pay cash? Yeah. Who should be in favors? That yeah. way they feel really committed to it. Yeah. yeah. You're getting a $10,000 speaker for only 2500 bucks. Congratulations. You're a winner. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Body language. You remember what a 10 out of 10 speaker looks like? Pirate. Yar. Okay. Shoulders back. Nice and tall. Just look like confidence. How do you hold a microphone? Like a flashlight going into your mouth. <laughs> this doesn't work. This does not work. And when people are doing this, it just makes me so mad. <laughs> Go like this. And, you know, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people when, there's an when there's an opportunity to have a microphone, they say, no thanks, I'll just project. 
And then they say something silly like, can you hear me? You see how that doesn't work? Because the people who can't hear you didn't hear the question. But also, your range changes. Like, I can speak like this, and I can whisper, and you can hear it in the back. We can do this with a microphone. But if I give the whole presentation like this, the whole thing is yelling. And when your vocal cords are projecting, it feels like stress. It's strained. So I can't, I can't be subtle. So become friendly with the microphone. Every time you've ever spoke ever, you've also vibrated your skull. And so there's a certain sound that you're used to, and it's not what we're hearing. When you hear your voice played back to you, you go, ew, what's that? Because you're hearing yourself while your skull is not vibrating. And that's what's happening with a microphone. You're hearing yourself, and it feels weird. It's okay, get used to it. Get comfortable with the microphone. When you see a microphone, run to it like it's a $100 bill in the wind. <laughs> Grab the microphone and speak. Imagine the clouds part, and from heaven comes down a golden microphone like in the WrestleMania, the let's get ready to rumble, and you could speak into it, and the whole world can hear. What would you say in the microphone? Turn to your neighbor and tell them. What would you say on the golden microphone from heaven that the whole world can hear? That's your message. Go ahead and tell your neighbor. All right, turn to your neighbor, look him in the eye, give him a high five and say you're awesome. Okay, I need a volunteer to come to the front and tell us what your message is. She's got it. It's a $100 bill in the wind. Give her a round of applause. They both turned to each other and said, love hard. Oh. Really? Nice work. Oh, and when you come to a microphone, uh, say your name and say what you do because there might be a client in the audience. And here's how you can say what you do. Don't say, I'm a, and then a thing. I'm a consultant, I'm a coach, because then that means there's lots of them, and you know there's only one of you, so say, I'm the. You can say, I'm the blank for blank who blank. You can say, I'm the type of person that you are for ideal client who have a desire. I'm the public speaking coach for entrepreneurs who want to grow their business with a speech. I'm the educator for naturopathic doctors who want to have a highly profitable business. I'm the stretch certification expert, guru, for gym owners who want to get better results for their gym clients. I'm the blank for blank who blank. That's model number one, the blank for blank who blank. I am the I am the producer for Experience House members who want to have a great time. I am the software engineer for startup tech companies who want to have a billion dollar exit. That's the blank for blank who blank. That's how you tell people what you do in a way that makes you the one and only. The is important. You're not A, you're the. Here's another model for explaining what you do. You know how problem, what I do solution. That's the model. You know how problem, what I do solution. You know how there's these concerts and people come and they dance and they sing, but they come home feeling like low vibe and drained and hungover? Well, what I do is I have beautiful meditative concerts that leave people feeling enlightened, lifted, and like they've just had a really nice nap. That's how I felt with your thing. Yeah. You know how some men get incarcerated? 
and they leave prison worse than when they came in, what I do is I work with those men so that they leave like leaders of their community, inspiring people, getting people to say, man, I kind of want to go to prison. <laughs> okay, so next person, share what you would say in the golden microphone, introduce yourself by name, and explain to the audience succinctly what you do. Come on up. Who's up? Who's up? Who's up? Come on, Suki. Uh, um, can I? Nope. Come can on I? up. Nope. Come on up. Okay. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> I'm the director for companies who want to tell amazing stories. There you go. Suki. <laughs> All right. What did you say in the microphone? What did you, what did you, what was the golden scepter? Oh yeah, what was your, what's your golden, uh, what the would golden you? Golden scepter? You're, sorry, your golden What would you tell the whole world? What's your message for the world? Oh, um, isn't this great? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Suki used one of my favorite word tools. It's called a question. <laughs> and hers is a really a fun question because it's also an exclamation. Isn't this great? Here's my favorite question of all time. Are you ready? How does it get any better than this? And if anyone responds, because a lot of people respond with, it doesn't. It's so good. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. How does it get any better than this? It's also an, exclam it's an exclamation. Man, how does it get any better than this? It's uh, a note of inquiry. We're, we're stranded on the side of the road. How does it get any better than this? My second favorite question is this one. If I totally and completely loved myself right now, what would I do? Everyone take your finger like this and form a little hook like this. Okay, so say it with me. Questions hook the mind. Go ahead. Questions hook the mind. Because you know how questions are like this little question mark, right? They hook the mind. They hook your mind. They hook other people's mind. Very powerful combination of words, questions. Really good conversationalists. Really good conversationalists ask great questions. You guys, we're in the presence of the mastermind of masterminds, JC, and she's going to ask some really good questions. What's the difference between a good mastermind and a great mastermind? Better questions. It's going to ask really good questions. When someone asks me, or when I ask someone a question and they say, I don't know, and there's, there's these people, they're like, I don't know people. They just like, they just need trick. I don't know. I don't know. They say it a lot. I ask them, it's like a Jedi mind trick. I say, well, if you did know, what would it be? And then they know. If you did know, what would it be? And then they know. I like that question too. All right, listening skills that would make your therapist jealous. I'm convinced that therapists go to school for like four years and the whole time they practice in unison. Hmm, and how does that make you feel? Say it with me. Hmm, and how does that make you feel? <laughs> so how do you know you heard somebody? They nod. What do you say? Thoughtful reflection. Like what? It sounds like this, you're experiencing this. Then you could lead into how does that make you feel, or you can reflect in a way that furthers the dialogue. So, if I'm hearing you correctly, the way you make people feel heard is you give thoughtful reflection. Yes. See what we just did? Yeah. So, what we did is he gave me information, I paraphrased it into my own understanding and said it to him, and then I asked him, Did I understand you? Welcome, welcome. Give Paul a round of applause, please! <laughs> Sit wherever you like, Paul. All right. Um, back to being on time and being trustable. <laughs> the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. And the way our brain works is we make shortcuts. We don't want to rethink about things over and over, so we make assumptions. So if, I, if you weren't quite precise with your language this time, I'm going to assume you're not quite precise with your language next time. If I couldn't count on you this time, I'm going to assume that I count, can't count on you next time. So my challenge for you is elevate your integrity. Your integrity is Dwizzywood. It's an acronym, Dwizzywood. Do what you said you would do. And when you say, I'll meet you at the pool at 11 o'clock, be there early like a champ. It's important. This is not a small point. 
So we were saying communication. The people that invented the internet, they made modems. And they said, we got to come up with a protocol that can deliver packages of data. And how are we going to know that the data was actually sent? And how do we know that the data that was received matches the data that was sent? So they came up with this internet protocol. They broke the data down into little bytes. And they would send a little byte from modem one to modem two. And modem two would get a byte. And they would go, oh, I got a byte. I better tell modem one I got that byte. And then they tell modem one, hey, modem one, it's modem two. You sent me a byte. This is what I've received. Is that what you sent? And then modem one goes, yeah, modem two, that's exactly what I sent. Here's another byte. And then modem two is like, okay, I got a new byte. Uh, modem one, is this what you sent? And then modem one's like, well, that's not really what I sent. I think you lost the package. Let me resend it. And then they resend it and they say, modem two's like, I got, I got a package from modem one. Is that what you sent? And modem one's like, you got it that time. And that's how internet works. Thank you very much. And that's how communication works. <clears throat> So a silly question is, do you understand? Kind of a silly question. If I say, do you understand, and you say yes, all I know is you think you understand. Communication's a bit weird like that. In fact, words are a bit tricky too. I say the word orange, what do you think of? Fruit? What do you think of? Color. The color? I used to ask this question in my communication class, and half would say fruit, and half would say color. And then this British woman said, the phone company. <laughs> and I was like, what? Did you hear the question? What do you think of when I said orange? And she said, yes, the phone company. I was like, what are you talking about, lady? There's a phone company called orange. Okay. So what does that mean? I say a word, and you're hearing different things. Right? So what are you actually hearing? You're hearing whatever you've associated to that word. Right? So people understand the words based on their own definitions. And their definition is probably different than your definition. Now add that that not everybody speaks English. Now add that not everybody hears that well. And good luck communicating. So what do we do? We act like modems. Can you tell me what you heard? Pablo, can you tell me what you've understood in the last minute from what I'm saying? Yeah, you can't guarantee what someone else is understanding when you say something. And it, the funny thing is, when you said orange, I thought the SIM card I just bought. I also just bought the SIM card at the orange company. I remember the British lady. Ah, that's the company. Yeah, okay, cool. So, Pablo, you're understanding that you can't guarantee understanding. Or SIM. Yeah. Okay. So you check in with someone. You want someone to feel heard. You say, is this what you're saying? Or, I can't even say what you're saying because I don't know what you're saying. I can only guess of what I'm hearing. Right, see the difference? Well, here's what I'm hearing versus here's what you're saying. You try to tell someone what they said, them fighting words, right? No, wait, you said this. Don't say you said, say, well, what I recall hearing is. You see the difference? All right. Here's a formula for answering questions from your audience. And how convenient. We have a question from the audience. Go ahead. When reflecting back to somebody what you heard in your own language, is there a way to best place this open question of, am I hearing this correctly? Like, I'm wrong. Your reflection it up versus, like, what I'm hearing is this? Is this what you were meaning to communicate? Like, in terms of that, That's a great question, Tyler. Tyler. What I heard in your question was, where's the best place to put in the, here's what I heard, and then reflect back to the question. Did I hear the question correctly? Yes. Okay, how to answer questions. Step one, reward the questioner. That's a great question. Thank you for the question. Step two, paraphrase the question. So if I heard you correctly, you're asking, where within the response do I say, this is what I heard? Did I understand the question? Okay, so I've rewarded the questioner because behavior that gets report, rewarded gets repeated. I've paraphrased and reflected the question to make sure I'm not about to start answering the wrong question. And now I'll answer. So I think I don't have a very profound answer, but I would say the beginning is better than the end because 
we're checking in, and the, these, these words are to communicate that I realize that I may not have heard you. So I'm going to say these words like, if I'm hearing you correctly, or what I'm hearing you say is, or, so let me get this straight. These are words that are saying, I am attempting to understand you. And then we rephrase the question, and then you might even sandwich it on the end with, did I get that right? Did I hear you correctly? Is that what you said? So I would say the beginning and the end, or if I had to choose the beginning or the end, I would say that the beginning. So instead of saying, you've asked the question, I say it back, did I hear you correctly? I will start with, so if I'm hearing you correctly, and then say it back. So if I'm hearing you correctly, by adding it in the front, it also paints to the individual that you're coming in from a place of curiosity and trying to understand, and then providing reflection. Yes, yes. And a lot of that can be communicated through posture and tone. A lot of like curiosity, eye contact. So right now I'm giving you my, my square body. My shoulders are in uh, perpendicular to you. So I'm, I'm giving you the floor. And even though I'm aware that everyone's listening, I hope, are you listening? Are you listening? Okay. I'm, I'm answering the question. And by the way, everyone can hear my answer to him better than you can hear my answer to you. Because when I'm answering you, you're having a whole bunch of thoughts in your head. But when I'm answering someone else, you can pay attention. So everyone gets to hear the answer. And so what Tyler and I have done is he very politely raised his hand. I acknowledged him. He asked the question. I said, thank you for the question. That's a great question. I rephrased the question. I checked if I heard the question. Then I answered the question. And now I'm going to say, thanks again for that question. That was a great question. So the formula for answering questions goes like this. Reward. Restate respond and reward again. Reward, restate, respond, and reward again. That's a great question. If I heard you correctly, this is what I hear you asking. Did I understand that question correctly? Okay, here's my answer. Thanks again for that question. That was a great question. Who else has a question? Yes. I have a follow-up question. Yes. Is this a systematic approach? As in, do you, if you have an audience of 100 people and you have a 10-minute Q&A, do you follow this formula for every single question? Because Will the audience kind of catch on to your thing, or do you move it around and try to, if you know directly the answer, you just theme it, and then some of them that are a bit more open, you kind of go with that technique? So you're asking, do you use this formula every time you ans ask a question? Indeed. That's a great question. <laughs> My exception to the rule would be for dramatic flair. Like, one time I was so proud of myself when someone, I was doing this, like, uh, personality quiz and this lady was like what does it mean if I have a four on this thing and a seven on that thing and I was like it means you're a serial killer and everyone loved it so it can be funny and it can be dramatic and it could be uh, quick-witted but the risk you take when you answer a question without restating it is you're ans possibly answering the wrong question now the question you didn't ask is is it okay if people see that I'm following a formula and my answer to that is, I hope they notice. I hope they notice. I'm doing it on purpose. I don't mind if they notice. Did I answer your question? Yes. That's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> yes. How would you get someone to ask a better question? Olivia, great question. You want to know how to get people to ask better questions? Can you ask a better question? Olivia, what's a different way of asking that question? How would you invite someone to... Like, say the thing, ask the question that they really want to ask. I feel like people don't really know how to ask great questions. Mm. That's interesting you should say that. What makes you say that? Olivia, can you take your glasses off? I want to see where you are. Yeah. I'm thinking of a time when I had an interaction with a participant. Yes. Where like, something really got lost in conversation. I felt like I really didn't see him. I 
so we had this, I was kind of answering a question that he wasn't really asking, and so I guess it's less about his question, more about my response. Mm. Yeah. Say more, please. In that interaction, he was needing something that I wasn't sure I could really give him, and I'm not sure it was the appropriate moment. And rather than name that, we got into this like conversation. We're, we're not really talking about the thing, which is like this isn't the moment to have the conversation. And now we're doing this kind of processing in front of other people. If you could redo the moment, what would you do differently? I think I would have really paused. And rather than think about giving him the thing he wanted and seeing it right, I would have just really seen him and listened. And then I would have offered an opportunity to connect outside of the context that we were in. And I, I would have named that this, I would have named that I actually don't think I can give you the thing you're in this moment, but I would love to talk to you outside of this <laughs> workshop. Great. Okay. Let me share with you what I'm hearing from you. So you had an experience at a workshop and you received a question and that brought you into a dynamic that you didn't really love and you're wanting some tools about how to be different. Didn't like the question. I can't even remember it, but it was, uh, I can't remember what he said, but it took us like. Okay, great. Yeah, the question he asked felt like it had no context to the, the conversation we were having. And it felt like somewhere in him he'd been hit by what we were talking about. So he was asking a question that didn't match what he was saying. And, okay. And then I got hooked by it and like tried to answer it and then I... Okay. Yeah. Olivia, I want to answer this question, but I don't think I can give you what you need right now. How's that feel? It's good. Okay. I don't want to use the word you. Yeah. I'm paraphrasing what you said you could have said differently. Yeah. I don't think I can give you what you need right now. Yeah. That's a dangerous phrase okay. because that might get the person to say, how do you know what I need right now? So eyes are safe, yous are dangerous. So I would love to answer your question. I would love some one-on-one -on -one time to go deep with you. Are you open to that? Okay. So. As a facilitator, facil, to make easy, we get to shapeshift. Yeah. And we start by being mind like water. And we get ourselves into a really malleable, flexible place. So that we can be soft and compassionate when we need to be. So that we can be big and bold when we need to be. And how do we do that? We get good sleep. We exercise. We take care of our brains. We meditate. We play music. We dance. We show up early. We don't fill our stomach with garbage the day before and the night before. We become an instrument for the moment. When you're getting a question like this, oftentimes people ask questions not because they want an answer. It's because they want attention or they want to be heard. So give them what they're looking for. Give them your attention. Give them uh, the feeling of being heard and own the room. One of the ways you can do that is with your body by standing with your voice by speaking into a microphone. I almost had to, I almost had to rein in Bruno over here. Bruno was coming with the question. There was an, the, the permission, to, to permission to ask questions was implied and then comments were being made. And so sometimes you gotta bring it in. So here's a lovely phrase when, a lot of people they process their thoughts by speaking and they're going and they're going and it's a runaway train. Here's the words, ready? Let me pause you there. Those are the words, let me pause you there. I'm not asking, I'm telling you, let me pause you there. So if someone's going and going and going, let me pause you there, I hear you. I would love to answer your question, and I will. Let's go one-on-one -on, -one on this. Sound good? Okay. So, how do we get people to ask a better question was the original question, and we ultimately got to how do we as a facilitator 
control the moment when it's feeling like it's going out of control. So one of the things that I did is I said, hmm, that's interesting. What makes you say that? It's one of my favorite questions. If I don't know how to answer a question, I go, hmm, that's interesting. What makes you say that? Now, the first thing I did was, was a bit rough because you asked me, how do you get people to ask a better question? I was like, well, can you make a better question? And how'd you feel in your body when I said that? Uh-huh. How did it feel? Was it tight? Yeah, it wasn't too tight. It was like, I felt like I went immediately to, okay, I've got to figure this out. And how'd that feel? Uh, a little tense, a little vulnerable. Yeah, tense and vulnerable are the opposite of what we should be making people feel in facilitation, which is safe. We want to make people feel safe. Tense and vulnerable, not safe. So if I wasn't being so playful and if I didn't trust you were already a master of facilitation, I would have said, that's an interesting question. What makes you ask that? It's soft. It's curious. And that is actually my answer to your question. Because you asked a question, and the question was, how do you get people to ask better questions? So my reflection to a mediocre question is, that's an interesting question. What makes you ask that? And now we go into what it's really about. Olivia, did I answer your question? You did. Can you tell me what you heard? I heard that uh, there's two opportunities. One is to make the person feel safe. Um, and the second is you want to get to the real thing. Make people feel safe. Get to the point as quickly as possible. Yes. Thank you for that question. That was a great question. Okay. What not to do. Let your phone die in the middle of a presentation when your notes are on it. However, I do have uh, my favorite bag and my favorite things in my bag. And do I have your consent to show you what's in my bag? Yes. Do you want to see what's in my bag? Yes. Say it like you mean it. Come on. Yes. Okay. Woo! Okay. MacBook, <laughs> MacBook Pro, because I'm a pro. So I'm all Apple everything, just deal with it, okay? Okay. Bluetooth speaker, speaker. JBL, yep. pairs with another. Did I bring two? Yeah. Of course I did. Uh, why? Because as a kid we were asked this question, if you could have a superpower, see through walls, fly, or have constant theme song music every time you enter into a room. I chose number three and then these are now real. So that's possible. Just a little book. Money's my friend. Uh, an iPad doubles as a second screen. And there's something about iPads that people, when they see that you have an iPad, they think you're creative and smart especially when it has the pen. You're like, they're like, oh, are you an artist? You have an iPad with a pen. Now, this is what I really wanted to show you. This is 20 bucks on, uh, this is 20 bucks on Amazon, and it's a really important thing for when you're on a Zoom call. So you take your laptop and you put it here. And this is a much better angle uh, for when you're on a call, okay? So angles on a call are important. Because when you're eye to eye, they trust you. When you're at a natural, when you're at the normal laptop angle, this is the angle that they're seeing you at. And psychologically, they think you're looking down on them. They think you're a monster and they're looking in your nose. It's not good. When you have this angle, what are they thinking about you? If your camera's up here, you're small. You're looking up like you're looking at mommy or daddy. You're small and tiny. So this is the right angle. Now, if you had a Zoom call to do, where would you place your camera for optimal lighting? Where would you put it, Harrison? If we're here? Yeah. The light behind the camera. The light is behind the camera is correct. The light is behind the camera. So the light's straight up here. So I would actually probably set it up just like this so that this is my background. 
Your background should be beautiful and not distracting. And if you have to choose between beautiful or not distracting, choose not distracting. Yes. Um, I think we also have a, another perspective on good lighting, and I'd like to give a uh, I would also, for, for, may, I, may I offer for anyone who might be interested in a different style of lighting? Yeah. Is that okay? Tell me more, yeah. Um, for those who are curious, please see three-point lighting on Google. Good. What's that? Three-point lighting? Just Google three-point lighting. Yeah, so we could just explain. So three-point lighting is 45 degree angles on left and right to fill your face. Uh, one should be a little bit stronger than the other, so you do have a little bit of a shadow, because if you're fully lit, equally, brightly, it's not natural. We're going for natural, because the brain is always seeking danger for survival, because the brain is optimized for survival. And if you don't look natural, Danger is clouding the experience of the communication. The third point, so that's point one, point two. The third point is point three, which is a light behind you that gives you a little glow and it pulls you off the background. Otherwise, you look flat into the background. So that's three point lighting. One, two, three. That's how my office is set up at home. And if you are, if you are, if you put the camera here, for example, and you were looking this way, this would be, first of all, now we've got really strong shadows, right? from this strong one single point of light. But if you have light behind you, you become a dark silhouette. And that's how Hollywood makes bad guys, dark silhouettes. So when you have a dark silhouette because you're sitting in front of a window and the camera is, here's the camera, here's you, here's a window, you're a dark silhouette, it doesn't look good. It looks like you're a bad guy. So lighting is important, it's part of the message. A little bit more about work in the room. So I've been here and I chose this location. Why do you think I chose this location? It's vibey. It's what is it? It's vibey. It's vibey. You got a strap over here. Yeah. Yeah. Can't leave. No. Okay. <laughs> so uh, standing by a door where people are coming in, very distracting. You don't want people coming in. One of the ways you get people to come in is you do all sorts of incentives to get people to be there on time. If I could rearrange this room, I would put myself over there so that if someone did come in, it would, be un it would go unnoticed. I would want to be opposite the entrance. Um, because the pillows are there, it's kind of like you guys are going to sit there. So the options were really one, two, or three. I'm going to put the microphone down. Now, because you're sitting here, I wouldn't really move around. This would be very dramatic. For me to do this would be very dramatic. I would have to have some sort of reason to move through here. But if, if there was a classroom, classroom style seating means you're at a chair and in front of you is a desk and there's a person to your left or right and they're all facing the teacher. So you can imagine walking through the middle of an aisle of classroom, right? Now, if you want someone to speak a little quieter and they're speaking loud, when you walk towards them, their voice goes down because the closer you get, the more it feels like they're shouting at you. So their voice goes down. If you want someone to speak up and they're quiet, walk away from them and they speak up because you are making them speak louder to get to you. So you can control how people speak by where you place yourself. If you find there's a little conversation happening and you don't really want to draw attention to it like, Pablo, you're talking, what are you doing? I could just move over here and that conversation will naturally die, okay? So where you place yourself can change people's uh, experience. Now, when you, are, when you have a stage, you can use the stage. When you're, when you're giving a presentation that has distinct sections and points, you can move to a different section of the stage when talking about that different point. If you're pacing the whole time, it's distracting because our brain is designed to pay attention to what's changing and moving. And so when your location is changing and moving, we're paying attention to that, looking for meaning in the movements, distracting. But if you want to move somewhere and plant yourself to make a point, you can go to another place and make a different point and you can refer back to the previous point. 
So use the stage and locations as anchors for points. When you're on stage, imagine your feet grow roots like a tree. You're not moving around. So that the only thing that's moving is your gestures and you gesture when you want to make a point. When you gesture too much, it's distracting. Another way that you keep people's attention is with your voice. This is what it sounds to speak like a monotone. If I speak in this tone and this pace, it's the same tone, it's the same pace. I'm not changing the pace, I'm not changing the tone. Eventually you won't even be able to hear the words that I'm saying. Eventually you'll fall asleep because your brain is designed to ignore the things that are constant. You don't even hear the things that are constant. For example, you stopped hearing the birds. And now you hear them. So the way the brain works is it looks for consistency and whatever is consistent after only a few seconds, it ignores it because it's optimized for change, because danger is in change. If you're looking at the bushes and one section of the bushes is moving, that's probably where the tiger is, so the brain goes, danger over there. But it ignores everything else that's constant. So you don't want to be the thing that gets ignored. So what are the tools that you have in your voice? You have volume, you can get louder, and you can get quieter. You can get faster and faster and faster, the faster you talk, you can get really exciting, and then you can get Slow, volume, pace, pitch, tone. If you're going to tell a story, please, for the love of God, act out the characters. It's more fun. Keeping people's attention is your responsibility. If I hear one of my clients say, I gave a talk, the audience was terrible. Uh-uh. Nope. You weren't funny enough. You weren't entertaining enough. Remember how I said they're probably hungover? Remember how they have an internet-connected supercomputer in their pants? You have to be more interesting than that. My wish for you is that when you speak, people forget that they have a phone. My wish for you is that when you speak, people forget time. They're just so there. That you can transport them into a place that they can feel it, see it, touch it, smell it, taste it. I'm committed to getting, out of you, getting you out of here in eight minutes. And I've come to the end of my exhausted list. The last point I want to make is how to be so in love with yourself and life that everywhere you go, people are just drawn to the magic that you are. And I believe the way you do that is you have a really great pep talk with yourself all the time. Because now that you are monk-like with your words, and you can hear the words that you say, and you can hear the words that you think, you get to upgrade your own language. The way I speak to myself is the way I speak to a dog. Come on, buddy. We're going to the gym. We're going to go, buddy. Hey, you woke up, buddy. Good job. You woke up this morning. Good job, buddy. And because I just love dogs. I love animals unconditionally. But that's not how I used to speak to myself. I used to speak to myself like my mom and dad used to speak to me because that's the voice we have in our head. And it wasn't as kind. But now that I talk to myself like a cute little puppy, it feels good. Um, I love throwing parties. And every party starts in your imagination. And the words that you use to describe the party is going to be lit. The way you communicate about the party because you went to Canva and you made a fresh little graphic. People are already partying hard at your party before they even get there. And if you want people to gather, raise your hand if you saw my description of, the, uh, of this presentation. How did it make you feel? Excited. Excited? Emojis are real. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot of feelings. Shout out to Olivia who helped me with those emojis. Um, I have time for questions. Do we have one? Yes, Ben? Um, thank you. This is amazing. Um, I was wondering if you could speak at all to the physiological things that some of us, myself included, experience when speaking in front of groups. And what, how to, what do you feel exactly? Uh, hard to breathe. Yeah. Uh, sweaty palms. Yeah. Shaky, yeah. Um, like hyper aware of everybody and every face. 
and very hard to connect to my God. And when you feel those things and you're trying to explain it to someone, you say, I am, and then what do you say? If you were trying to explain to someone how you're feeling right now with all those things, and you said, I am, and then you said an adjective, what would the adjective be? Okay, so try this one. I am excited. I am excited. Yeah. Excited and scared, basically the same physiology. Excited and nervous, basically the same thing. I am excited about my talk coming up. By the way, we've got some fire talks coming up, and we got a second workshop this afternoon, fire talk prep. Um, so I am excited. Tell your body, I am excited. Oh, oh, I'm feeling things. I am excited. Wow. Um, and the most powerful tool you have to transmute all this energy from fear and anxiety or excitement into poise and focus and enthusiasm, we have one tool that transmutes it, and it's the breath. Ah. Uh. So, if you want to just like get there, the path is with your breath. So, just like your whole chemistry factory, your whole laboratory, and you manufacture all the good feelings too, and you do it with your lungs. Mm. So, tell yourself you're excited. So, the words that you tell yourself, like, uh, Sarah woke up this morning and she said, I am sick. I am feeling sick. I am healing and upgrading. Let's go, baby. A little bit of self-delusion. I'm healing. Okay. Um, and transmute it with your breath. Yes. Tyler. Thank you, Najib, for uh, a very insightful and impactful conversation. My question for you is more on the receiving end of answering a question. Usually I'm more of a space, a podcast format and style. When the question is posed to you and you're responding as the expert, if there, I think to engage the audience and keep the audience engaged, two ways of responding to that question. So let's say the question is, a lot of people struggle with blood sugar regulation, diabetes is very common. What are some of the most impactful tools that people can utilize to improve blood sugar control? And I think of two ways to respond. One is maybe lift out four or five things, like these are the biggest modulators for improving blood sugar control up front, exercise, food, sleep, stuff like that, and then go into detailed descriptions of each of those factors, let's say, as opposed to starting with one, like let's say, we know that the PDE plays a profound role in blood sugar control, and speaking specifically on the nutrition piece, and then going into the next piece, sleep, etc. What do you feel, or have you noticed to be most impactful to people can follow and there's retention with following the conversation but also leaves it open for a dynamic conversation where you're not kind of just taking all that space and kind of just spewing all these facts. Okay. Great question, Tyler. So the question is, what's the best way to answer questions on podcasts that allow for a dynamic conversation? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, great question. So it starts before the podcast. It starts with your identity. Own that you're an expert. The word expert comes from experience. You've got experience. I'm an expert. Uh, I used to play improv games. And one of the improv games we play is called expert. And what we do is we get the whole troop to line up, and one person's it, and they're the expert. And then someone calls out some random ex expertise, like you're an expert in sloth poop. And then the first question asks you a sloth poop specific question. And they say like, uh, what's the shape and color, and how can you tell if a sloth has been on a keto diet or a, or a, a you know, carb-free diet? And the expert will answer it. Well, you say, well, the way uh, you can tell if a sloth uh, poop has been a keto diet is, of course, it has a clear clumping and uh, sort of a purplish color, and the smell smells like a magnolia flower. And the, the expert is just designed to just answer like an expert. And you play that game, and you realize you can bullshit real nice, real fast, and you can just let it flow. So, so when it's not flowing, it's because it's stuck up here in judgment. So where does the flowing come from? It comes from trust, it comes from channeling. That happens in, at the identity level. I am an expert in this. My answer is legit. Breathe, let it flow. Don't be afraid to pause. Introverts process their thoughts and listen to what they're wanting to say before they say it. They literally say it in their own head and they're like, yeah, that sounds smart. Okay, I'm gonna talk now. Extroverts are like, 
I'm gonna start talking. Let's see where this thing goes. Okay, so don't feel bad if you pause, breathe. Most podcasts are edited as well, so even if it's like a 10 second pause, which feels like a lifetime, that's okay. Take as much time as you need. You can say, that's a great question, what makes you ask that, if you want to buy some time and get some insight. So this is all if it's like feeling stuck at the beginning. Then answer your questions with your list. And there's four things I would recommend. I'd recommend this, 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 and this. And then say one of these two things. Let me give you an example. Or let me tell you a story. Because that takes the fact and it makes it more better understood through example or through story. Now, in terms of creating engaging conversations, depending on the interviewer, they might just sit back and just go, this is your, your answering. Or they might want to jump in. And so you'll determine what kind of play that's going to be like. If you are trying to encourage engagement, you can ask, what do you make of that? Or, what do you see that I don't see? What do you make of that? Or what do you see if I don't see? That's just to bring them into the conversation, if that's what you're trying to create, this engagement, with the interviewer. Did that answer your question, Tyler? That does answer my question for like the interviewer. I think my question's a little bit more dictated on the consumer, and maybe this is something that I could pull the audience as well as what, how they would be able to receive that information if it's a little bit more bullet-fronted up front of what is going to be discussed and then discussing in more detail as opposed to... Okay. So this is what we call tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. So if you say, uh, well, really there's three things. There's keto, there's no carb, and there's carnivore. So let's talk about keto. Da, 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 da. And then now let me tell you about no carb. Da, 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 da. And now let me tell you about carnivore. Da, 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 da. So those are the three things. It's keto, no carb, and carnivore. That answers my question. Tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. So you're giving them the structure where here's where we're about to go over the next three minutes. And then you're going to go into each point, And then you're going to say, so here's what we just covered, this, this, and this. Does that help? Thank you. Thank you for yeah. My One second, Pablo. Okay, I am going to wrap it up here. Uh, you got a quick one? Go ahead. This is, I think it's an important one, especially yeah. for your live talks. Um, how, how do you recommend a person handle, two part question, but quick, um, when you are potentially covering a potentially polarizing topic and there's someone in the audience or in a QA session that maybe gets like, personally offended by something that you said? They want to ask, ask a question or potentially even interject, and it becomes combative and potentially even disruptive. Yeah. How do you handle that? How do you recommend Okay, that? great. So, this may offend some of you. This may activate some of you. I like to use the word activate instead of trigger. Um, as, as, if you're feeling a little activated here, just breathe. You're going to be all right. Now, if the, if, the, if the audience wants to interject, body language like this. If the, if the interjection is coming over here, I'm shutting that down. So I'm keeping it here. And I'm using this and I'm using my, my standing. And I hear you. We're going to hear you in just a minute. So a little bit of body language, a little bit of warning, and own the facilitation. Because what can happen is this can start happening and then I start going like this and then now, now I'm not facilitating. I'm relinquishing control. So I hear you. Let me, let, me, let me pause you there. Let me pause you there. We're going to get to you in a minute. Okay? So a little bit of body language, a little bit of owning the room, a little bit of warning. And wait, hang on. Let me pause you there. If, if your words are coming and, if, and I can feel the energy of the room, it's getting a little sharp. Let me pause you there. Is, there. is there a nicer way of saying that? Tone. Let me pause you there. To answer your question, Pablo. Yeah, and then what if it's in a Q&A session where you're already in dialogue and it starts to escalate and potentially like a runaway train gets derailed? Yeah, we're going to pause right there. Yeah. We're going to pause right there. Let's, let's take that offline. Okay? All right, I'm going to close with a line I learned from a magician. If you feel the need to clap, go ahead and let it out. Thank you very much.